Morgan, thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, we're here with Jenny Rometty. And Jenny, thank you so much for taking the time to see us. My pleasure. Yeah, a busy day for you. You've been here not only at the BRT, but also at the White House this morning with a, a group of other technology CEOs and That's other right. leaders. Yes. What, what happened at the White House today? Yeah, no, we had a, we had a very interesting discussion. It was, a, I would call it an innovation summit. And it was really a discussion about what do we need to do to be sure America is in the lead. And uh, it was interesting because it was AI, quantum, 5G. And I think the message most of us wanted to communicate was, look, you don't want to just be in the lead. You want to be number one. This is about playing to be the best in the world. So we were talking about what are the different kinds of things, both policy and non, that would help us be in the lead in those areas. Part of that is spending. There was a point made here on the panel earlier today um, that we used to spend four times as much as China did on AI. And today, those levels of spending are about the same. Yeah. Although, uh, to be honest, we, we do agree that some more spending is needed in places. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's in agreement, though, that some of the number one things are to more organize what it is that we're doing. And that that's one of the biggest things where you can organize. We have national labs in this country. What do they all do for AI? Get that organized. One of the biggest pressing needs on AI is an ethical framework and a responsible framework for AI. It's one of the inhibitors because you're always balancing commercial use with security issues. It's true. It's going to be true with all these products. And so let's get that framework written. And I was sharing, I think there's a really great learning learning here from GDPR. You've often talked about it on the show in Europe, in that with GDPR, Europe took the lead on that and drove it. Now, everyone had to comply whether you had a problem or not. And I was just in the EU last week, and the issue is that, you know, 30 other countries are now copying that. So we said, look, when it comes to AI and an ethical framework, if we don't take the lead, Somebody else does, and it fills a void. And so we've got to get moving on these things. GDPR, for those who don't know it, um, just about everybody in our audience does, but it was the privacy regulation yes, that the EU yeah. put into place. For in data, May. data protection. Um, right. You were pretty vocal when you were over at the EU most recently, saying that you think some of our um, consumer technology companies have just been flat out irresponsible. Well, I, I think the point, and we've talked a lot here about what has been one of the things that slows an economy down, it's regulation. Mm -hmm. And so you only want to regulate a problem. Don't over-regulate. And I think what we stand is if a company does mishandle data, we don't want to be in a position that we take a sledgehammer, as I said, over regulation. Instead, where are the problems? Regulate the problems. And I think that's what you've got to do, or we will. M my fear is that the lowest common denominator or the is going to determine the digital economy. And so instead, find a problem, legislate a problem. And I, and I think that can happen with people being liable for what, you know, things that terrorism, other things on platforms, and that's where you should focus. Is it frustration then that you, you see a couple of bad actors and you worry that yeah, there's going to be bad regulation? I, I think that's the right way to frame it is that, like we talked about, something like GDPR regulation, you want to get ahead of this. And before something gets written that's overarching, hey, let's be clear that we know what problems are and then let's legislate if needed and regulate those kinds of problems. Having said that, do you think a GDPR-like solution would be one that would be well-served here in the United States? Something that very Look, I think the most important thing is now that there is, and those of us, many of us are global players, we've all now, we comply, we put in, we put the money in. You don't want different ones everywhere. So I think the most important thing is there does need to be data privacy now, but have it be harmonized globally, because it would be worse to have a patchwork set of regulations. Sure. Uh, Jenny, one of the reasons we've seen so much volatility in the markets recently is because of concerns about what's happening with trade. Um, obviously, that's a moving target, and uh, the market seems to change its mind on a day-to-day -day basis. But today, the big reason that there was so much was concern was in part because of hearing that the Huawei CFO had been detained. Some people were reading into that that uh, we're not coming to some sort of agreement anytime soon with China or that we're really ratcheting things up. What would you say in terms of Huawei and in terms of what you see with trade talks right now? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, having spent a day here as you have all day, I, I hear from many different parties a very positive, just what we've seen, a very positive discussion about that there is a way forward here to work through this 90-day period with China. So mm -hmm. I am cautiously uh, glad to hear what I heard about those things, yeah. that that's going to have a, a positive way forward, and that it includes things, I hope, like market access, right? That's some of the most important things, uh, that there'll be a way here. So throughout the day, I mean, I've heard people feeling, just as what we've all been told, that there was a set of agreements and that there's a good basis to now move forward over the next 90 days and certainly make some progress. Having said that, Huawei is another uh, discussion that we've had here uh, on stage and even with some of our conversations we've had here on air. Um, 
Just this idea that, again, we have to be setting the standards. We can't assume that that's going to happen. If you watch the case of Huawei, uh, the rest of the world's going to pick up wherever the market leader is. What, yeah, you know, yeah and, and, I, and I can't speak to their situation, sure. but I do know if you're going to play across the world, as an example, we obey the laws. And so, you know, we obey the export laws that are here. And that's an important part of being able to play on a global stage. Let, let's talk a little bit about jobs, because tomorrow we have a jobs number coming out. And while we're looking at really great numbers uh, from the nation's perspective, 3.7% unemployment was the last report we got. Um, the one downside to that has been that a lot of technology companies and others have had a hard time finding talent. How about you? What's your situation in terms of being able to find people who are qualified to fill the jobs that you have open? Well, I tell you what, we get 7,000 applications a day. So I, I've got more than enough applications, but that isn't generally true for the world here, and it's not generally true for every company, because your comment, there are 7 million, there are 7 million job openings, and there are more than enough people looking, but they're not qualified and that's that's really been a lot of our discussion here today and as part of the business roundtable we're putting together a platform of how do you get America ready because it's technology is really the part of the skill you have to have to fill these seven million jobs and that's why people struggle at them um, what, what about the new role you have here at the BRT it was just announced today you're, you're going to be in charge of one of the work yes yes so, I, so I, 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 uh, I accepted being the chairman of the committee on education and the workforce and so we really are going to frame a program we called it um, Tomorrow Ready, meaning having America have the skills ready for tomorrow, today. Tomorrow Ready in an America that always learns. And it is this issue that 7 million, 7 million job openings, not enough people to fill them. And if you go under it, what we're really going to start to... Um, I think try to make some headway on is that 185 billion is spent every year in higher education here, yet only one third of our working population has a bachelor's degree. Now, does everyone need one? Our conclusion is no. So what we are really going to put forward is a platform that says, how do we broaden the base so that more people can participate in this economy, not always with college degrees, and um, retraining is a big piece of that. And then how do we make more efficient that $185 billion? And so this is a, you know, one of the things we do is policy here. And the Higher Education Act is up for reauthorization. So sometimes timing's everything next year. 100 billion on federal loans, 30 billion on grants, and then work study programs over a billion. If you, we can make some simple inroads that get, take work study. Right now, 75% of the money has to be spent for jobs on a campus. Well, let's flip it. What about for apprenticeships, internships, out with small, medium business? You'll get the skills. When it comes to a grant uh, or a loan for school, Right now, you have to be a full-time student. You have to be getting a bachelor's or a graduate degree. Well, well, no, what about instead someone who's changing careers? And what about helping them with the apprenticeship, the credentials? They don't have to be a full-time student. And I think we can have much of America then participate and really quickly make some inroads here on being able to su both supply the jobs and then our side is on the demand side, be willing to take in people of all different education levels to fit the right jobs. Jenna, the last time you and I spoke was uh, the morning after you announced, or the morning you announced the acquisition of Red Hat. That's right. How, how are things going with the acquisition? Has there been anything at all that surprised you? Yes. Uh, no. The only surprise is how much clients think it's a great idea. So it is confirmed absolutely why we did it. Everyone sees the challenge that they have still 80% left of their work that they would like to move into a cloud world, but it's hard. And they also say, it's a multi-cloud world too, not just one cloud they're going to. And this is what that answer is that gives them no lock-in. And so helps them move it, helps them manage it, and that's the future. And that's how they get their both cost efficiency and innovation. So I have had nothing but a thousand percent uh, really strong support from clients. Uh, Morgan mentioned at the top of this when she tossed to us that IBM was the best performing or Dow component today. Um, but if you look at the year, it's the second worst performing Dow component after Goldman Sachs. What is Wall Street missing? Yeah, well, look, I think, you know, this has been, what are they missing? Clearly undervalued, right? Because the role we play, and you look at, is it always about growth? As we've looked at our business, we both transition mission critical work past to the future and to the cloud. And so really our role is about being a high value company, but doing things that are both today's current mission critical work, as you and I have always talked about, and transitioning clients to the future. And I think we've placed our bets in the right ways and you've seen us make progress. As you saw us return to growth, you saw our margins return after we've made all these investments. And so I think we now just need to show that and continue to consistently perform.